because uh, partially uh, because of the live streaming and just for everyone in the room, um, do your best to, to keep the mic uh, right, nice and focused. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Sandra Sujin Lee, uh, who is a medical anthropologist whose research focuses on the sociocultural dimensions and ethical issues of emerging technologies and their translation into clinical practice. Among Dr. Lee's projects uh, include NIH-funded studies such as Beyond Consent, Patient Preferences for Governance of the Use of Clinical Samples and Data, and Social Networking and Personal Genomics, Implications for Health Research. In a recently funded study, Dr. Lee and her team examines conceptions of diversity and inclusion and their operationalization in precision medicine research. Currently, at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, Dr. Lee will, in fact, be transitioning to Columbia University to join the new Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics as the chief of the Division of Ethics. Let's welcome Dr. Lee. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, special thanks to Eric and Joel for putting together such a a great group. I'm, I've learned a lot this morning, and I know that I will learn more uh, in the next uh, day and a half. Uh, what I've been asked to do is to uh, discuss some of my work on direct-to-consumer genomics, but um, just as a, a preface, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do in the talk is to really think about genomics, consumer genomics, within a shifting landscape of of uh, healthcare systems, the learning healthcare system, and some other ways in which we are collecting data, personal health information and otherwise, um, and to try to put consumer genomics in perspective and, and, and to think about historically what, why this is an important uh, phenomena and how it um, has led in terms of a certain trajectory um, and what it means for uh, biocitizenship. So, um, Genomic sequencing is transform transformational technology has, since the completion of the Human Genome Project, been cloaked in the promissory language of health, justice, and human progress that can be ushered into full potential through capital and a culture of hope. Emerging within the nexus of biopower, genomic technologies are the result of the internalization of scientific concepts of health and normality linking the human body to a growing infrastructure of organized knowledge in which the biocitizen has become a subject of social control that links individuals to ways of knowing that are seamless yet opaque. In this talk, I'd like to situate commercial genomics within this larger landscape of healthcare research and ethical debates over the status of individuals, groups, and institutions in the construction of what we understand as the common good. Specifically, genomic science and its commercialization in services and products has challenged conceptual relationships and boundaries between what is biological versus social, uh, uh, private versus public, individual versus communal, which has implications for the assessment of risk, benefit, responsibility, ownership, freedom, and obligation. Major changes in healthcare and its interface with clinical and increasingly basic uh, and increasingly basic science research has contributed to a focused intensity on a systematic collection of personal data. The boundary between clinical care and research that is the bedrock for so much of the ethical infrastructure built up since the Belmont Report nearly 50 years ago has been challenged and many argue eroded with the pursuit of this seamless translation of bedside sciences to bedside care. Uh, the shifting landscape has led to major exhaustive and systematic ongoing data collection um, and reframings of the meaning of the human subject and the subjectivities of what it means to be a patient, a research subject, and health consumer, and, and its implications for the balance of responsibilities and obligations. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see. <laughs> Drawing on my anthropological research of the personal genetic testing industry over the past decade, I hope to raise questions about how genomics and its implication within a growing nexus of technologies aimed at collecting, curating, and sharing personal data and biological Im materials impact our understanding of the human body as a data resource and responsibility of individuals vis-a-vis -vis the larger social, social collective. Okay. 
the trope of the good citizen is useful in understanding these expectations in the context of increasing data collection and passive surveillance in the name of health, national security, and, and ever more system efficiency. The good citizen builds not on a legalistic framework of citizenship, but instead on one that defines citizenship through action and effort. It is understood as a virtuous set of practices through which the extent uh, which the extent and equality of one's citizenship are functions of one's perception of the greater community and the responsibility it demands. This begins, of course, with the assumption that a greater community or collective exists for which, through which the good citizen achieves its sense of duty and membership. The rise of consumer genomics exemplifies the ex expected practices of the good citizen the emergence of direct-to-consumer genetics in which consumer access uh, genetic information tests individualized results via the internet is a natural outgrowth of a political project based on neoliberalism and, a contemporary, and contemporary transformations in medicine that construe disease and its management through economic rationalities. Sorry, let's see here. Okay. Um, what cons uh, using David Harvey's definition of new neoliberalism in asserting that genetics is increasingly invoked through the assumptions that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedom and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property results, free markets, and free trade. I'm going to use this framework to contextualize direct-to-consumer genomics as emblematic of precision medicine and its goal of excavating and leveraging individual differences in genes, environments, and lifestyles to catalyze a new era, as they say, of database and more precise medical treatment. In analyzing consumer genetics as a form of public hygiene, I would like to raise uh, questions that probe the normative valence of how actors are to engage and relate with their genetic information. Uh, what constitutes health in the era of precision medicine? How did the interests of the state, corporate entities, and the public collide and, recon and are reconciled in the development and deployment of genetic technologies? How do notions of the good citizen depend not only on shared understanding but equitable distribution of the common good? How do direct-to-consumer direct genetics and the ubiquity and ease of accessing genetic information impact social connections, identity ma making, and modes of participation, the production of biomedical knowledge, and the meaning of human difference? In engaging these questions, I'd like us to consider the paradigm shift toward access to personal genetic information and describe how direct-to-consumer genetics reflects reframings of patients as biocitizens, thus creating new expectations and obligations that shift responsibility for health to the marketplace and ultimately onto the public. <coughs> Technological developments such as the internet, mass ownership of the personal computer, and increasingly cost-effective genetic sequencing have converged with a healthcare system that encouraged patients to be information seekers. Over the past several decades, these forces have fueled a proliferation of companies that sell per personal genetic information directly to consumers via the internet. The direct-to-consumer genetic testing market in the United States has grown dramatically over the past decade. 2016, it was estimated to be worth $11.9 billion. That number has, has uh, increased considerably over the last three to, uh, two to three years. A large proportion of this market is focused on genetic ancestry testing. More than 50 companies cur uh, currently provide genetic ancestry testing, including Ancestry DNA and African DNA, as well as National Geographic, which has incorporated genetic ancestry testing as part of a global sampling initiative uh, called the Genographic Project. The bundling of genetic ancestry information with other types of testing and screening, including nutrigenetic, pharmacogenetic, and paternity testing and newborn screening, has been championed by 23andMe, a small startup uh, company founded by two women entrepreneurs in, uh, about a dozen years ago in my uh, neighborhood, uh, Silicon Valley. Under the banner uh, is just saliva, no blood, no needles. 23andMe issued a significant challenge uh, to the conventions and policy that aim to protect individuals from their genetic information. By issuing a simple invitation to engage in self-discovery, 23andMe attempted to reorient the public uh, to the power of genetic information. Uh, 
in one of the most racially and ethnically diverse neighborhoods uh, in Mountain View, uh, 23andMe was established and began to offer genetic test results and the ability for cons consumers to download their raw data or their uninterpreted genetic sequence. Customers pur purchase test kits online and receive a set of materials and simple instructions on how to generate sufficient saliva to deposit into the plastic vial. The customer then sends the sample in the prepaid package to the company's lab for DNA extraction and analysis. Using a gene chip uh, that can analyze uh, millions of single nucleotide polymorphisms, the company uploads ancestry determinations and risk ratios of specific genetic markers associated with diseases and conditions um, around six to eight weeks, uh, weeks after its initial uh, purchase. And some of you probably recognize this picture. This is, some, this is actually quite dated. Uh, this was uh, on the front page, not of the science section of the New York Times, but rather the fashion section. Um, in which uh, it likens uh, this uh, sampling uh, party, a spit party, uh, to a kind of Tupperware party. And I, I realize many of you probably don't even know what Tupperware is. So um, <laughs> anyway, for what, what it's worth. Um, so this is the type of turn uh, that 23andMe has been able to uh, to hasten in terms of how we think about genetic information is really recreational genetics, uh, personal luxury, a commodity that, um, that uh, those who have discretionary income to spend at that time, it was a, about $1,000 to uh, take the test in 2007. Um, it's gone considerably down, but nonetheless, it started as a luxury uh, good. Bundling a broad spectrum of medical tests for disease risks, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Tay-Sachs diseases with non-medical traits such as eye color, bitter taste perception, and alcohol flush re reaction, the company stresses that getting to know your genes is fun. Framing it with the pleasures of hobbies and entertainment, 23andMe has pulled genetics away from a framework of being the weighty enterprise of genetic testing traditionally overseen by healthcare professionals to a private, private matter between the consumer and the company. Direct-to-consumer genomics takes deliberate aim at the paradigm of protection that inform practices and policies on genetic testing to assert the notion that individuals have a right to their data. This involves several key changes. Uh, conventional wisdom that only patients, those with demonstrated history or symptoms of disease should be eligible for testing has eroded, giving rise to the assumption that healthy individuals should have the choice to test for a range of diseases and conditions they may or may not be considered actionable. With this change, the therapeutic warrant uh, see, of seeking genetic information based on prior risk is rendered obsolete for those willing and able to pay for testing. Enabling this shift are the new portals of genetic information that are available through the internet which circumvent the clinician and, the pla and place genomic information in a larger domain outside of the healthcare system. These develop de developments represent a challenge to a decades old paradigm of protection and a reconfiguration of the social relationships structured by the flow of genetic information. The sale of personal genetic information through companies reflects a pendulum shift uh, from an era of circumscribed use of genetic tests to one that offers open access to test results as well as individual uninterpreted raw genetic uh, information. Personal genetics and precision medicine have been steeped in the language of empowerment from the onset of the Human Genome Project. The proliferation of tools and databases that are freely available to an interested public have given rise to do-it-yourself genetics. These technological developments frame personal genetic information as extension of the body, tapping the potential for self-knowledge that reframes genetic information as a right. Uh, genetic information has become a portal for improved health and also a gold mine for personal knowledge and understanding. Building on the trope uh, of empowerment, the personal genetic testing industry has marketed its products as tools of discovery in health management. Um, and I think many of you have probably seen these, this type of language um, that is used to um, market uh, direct-to-consumer uh, genomics, uh, the idea that you have uh, this kind of genetic potential that really just needs to be tapped and to flourish um, uh, with these types of um, services that you can get now online. And despite strong claims by 23andMe that it is not in the medical diagnostic business, many 23andMe customers took their disease risk information ser seriously, drawing comfort from normal results uh, and becoming concerned when confronted with elevated risk ratios. 
For example, Peter, a 32-year-old high school teacher living in St. Louis, was given a 23andMe kit by his mother as a birthday present. He described his mother as the, the gene genealogist in the family. He was not familiar with the company or the range of tests it offered be before receiving his mother's gift, but he wanted to find information about his genetic ancestry if it meant that it would further his mother's research on their lineage. Several weeks later, when he received the email indicating that his information was available, he described a surpri surprising sense of relief when he clicked through his test results, knowing that two members of his extended family had been diagnosed with colon cancer. He said that discovering that he had only an, quote, average risk of developing the disease offered him and his wife the ability to breathe easy. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, it goes on. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Peter says, it was quite useful in that we felt this specter of colon cancer that might be just hanging out there for everyone in my generation and younger was actually sort of now removed because I know according to 23andMe, I have average genetic risk, so I feel confident in being able to manage uh, the environmental factors, end quote. The pendulum shift that has allowed for customers such as Peter to access data represents more than a simple repositioning of genetic information in the public domain. It has ushered in a new set of practices for managing one's body and health. Self-care and agency in the neoliberal context uh, go beyond assuming the role of being one's own doctor. It is deeply rooted, a, a deeply rooted sense of responsibility that has shifted from the medical model to a preventative approach that compels individuals to consciously use a means-ends calculus that balances risk, responsibility, and networks of social resources. At its core, uh, is this neoliberalist, uh, neo neoliberal sense of agency that demands reflexivity and an understanding that the self becomes a project in and of itself. Another 23andMe customer, Claire, an assistant at an architect firm in Seattle, describes her feeling of newfound ownership for her genetic risks uh, for disease. And she says, uh, it makes uh, me feel more of a responsibility taker for my own health, and my health is my responsibility, not the responsibility of my physician or the system. Now that I can get information and make it actionable myself, for example, for conditions like coronary artery disease and rheumatoid arthritis where I'm at higher risk, I feel I have a responsibility to take action." End quote. So in many ways, Claire and Peter um, embody what Nicholas Rose and others have described as integral to uh, the biocitizen. Um, they have written that the responsibility for the self now implicates both corporeal and genetic responsibility. One has long been responsible for the health and illness of the body, but now one must also know and manage the implications of one's own genome. The responsibility for the self to manage its present in light of knowledge and its own future can be termed Genetic prudence, such a prudential norm, introduces new distinctions between good and bad subjects of ethical choice and biological susceptibility. As critical biomedical facts, risks do not exist a priori, rather they come into being through interpretive acts. Risk and its interpretation have been important features of how individuals and groups are managed, as well as significant dimensions of neoliberal approaches to health. Sociologists have argued uh, that risk is a crucial rationality in neoliberal, uh, neoliberal economies and its attendant techniques of rule and forms of citizenship. Uh, political scientist Wendy Brown has called for an analysis of the convergence of this biomedical paradigm with the ideal of neoliberal citizen subjects as, quote, rational, calculating creatures whose moral autonomy is measured by their capacity for self-care that ability to provide for their own needs and to service their own ambitions, an individual who is fully responsible for him or herself. Efforts to reconstruct individuals as consumers and the investments made by commercial and other interests rely on government framing of individual health as public health, where access to personal genetic information becomes an important issue of democracy. In neoliberal economies, there is a blurring of the roles of state individuals and the market, as well as a skepticism about the capability of governments to properly govern. These conditions lead to an emphasis on markets as the proper regulators of economic and social activity, with entrepreneurship replacing programs promoting social welfare. Through self-examination and self-care, self-governance becomes part of the project of reducing the burden of individuals on society. 
as individuals are charged with the responsibility of pr to prevent uh, diseases that begin with managing risky mutations, corporatization of self-care provides entrepreneurial opportunities for calculating, quantifying, and creating markets and products on the assumption that the public is responsible for actively confronting individual risk and engaging in risk control. Direct-to-consumer genetic cons consumers' claim of self-expertise is crucial in their ability to make these decisions about health-improving activities. In so doing, they have, as Linda Hogle says, been transformed for healthy individuals into potential patients into educated consuming subjects. In this view, real democracy functions through some combination of governments by ex government by experts and a willing public that strategically navigates the risk uh, their risks in order to promote individual health to reap the benefits of collective rationality. Social networking platforms facilitate this process as individuals upload their health information along with genetic data for further research. Networking platforms such as Patients Like Me and Facebook were early precursors to the commercial biobanks in encouraging patients to exchange their experiences with other members um, of uh, the sites and contribute aggregated data from in-house research as well as more conventional drug trials. And so you must, uh, those of you who are familiar with 23andMe know about his uh, main feature, its research arm, which um, in my interviews with the venture capitalists that have been funding the company is really the gold mine for the company, not the fee for service, but rather the repository of data that's being collected from, his, from their uh, consumers. Um, and uh, the, this type of effort, uh, I think it, we can see, is rather ubiquitous. Uh, it seems that every healthcare system now is trying to develop its own research data bank uh, based on this return of results um, in terms of both, um, in, in, in most cases, actionable information, but in some, in some cases, more recreational information. Uh, as part of this effort, the company, uh, 23andMe, announced the One Million Strong campaign to enroll one million customers into the 23andMe Biobank as an example to push, uh, to, to push uh, a scale up in biomedical research through individual donations, as they were called, of genetic samples gifted in the context of the, of the genetics marketplace. Articulated as uh, genetic, quote, democratization and individual empowerment, and quote, individuals are both consumers and the company's research participants. In this way, 23, uh, the 23andMe experience becomes the actualization of self-care and integral to the common good. Anthropologists and other social scientists have provided analytics frameworks, frameworks that challenge this trope of the good citizen by framing the proprietary built biobanks built through the accumulation of their customers' samples as surplus health um, and biovalue that is necessary for the genetic economy. Uh, gen consumer genomics adopts the promissory language of data mining where corporate interests operate through a narrative of democratization and patient advocacy that often elides questions about bodily capital and uh, labor. Um, so I, I want to think about uh, personal genomics, but then move to these other transformations that are occurring in, in the uh, research landscape uh, in terms of the collection of information. As the private sector becomes a central source of genetic information and a site of public engagement with precision medicine, the state reframes genetic health as a matter of justice and the elimination of health disparities. Uh, we know from uh, President Obama's uh, 2015 State of the Union address where he announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, which was renamed in 2006 as the All of Us Initiative, um, that there is this goal uh, taken on by NIH and the federal government to embark on, quote, a new era of medicine through research, technology, and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work toward the development of indiv individualized care. Described as patient, a patient-powered cohort, the All of Us uh, campaign will enroll one million American volunteers uh, to share a comprehensive set of data with the government, uh, including their medical history, profiles of their genes, meta metabolites, microorganisms, environmental and lifestyle data, as well as patient-generated uh, uh, information from individual personal devices and sensor data. Uh, volunteers are asked uh, for their consent to deposit their uploaded, uh, updated data um, for at least a decade after they initially are enrolled into uh, the, the initiative. 
Um, and this gives you a sense of the kinds of data that um, they are interested in collecting, everything from uh, your biological samples, uh, your electronic health record data, physical measurements, as well as patient-provided uh, information. Um, they're still trying to decide what kinds of results that they'll be returning, um, certainly medically actionable information, but also other kinds of information that, um, that the individual volunteer uh, would like. Describe with familiar, uh, within, uh, with the familiar promissory language emphasizing potential speed and the development of new treatments that has only just begun to be tapped, and quote, a central aim of the initiative is to enroll individuals who identify with groups historically and underrepresented, uh, historically underrepresented in biomedical research to reflect the diversity of the U.S. population. In its call to arms, uh, the All of Us project emphasizes that achieving its goals relies on a coordinated and sustained national effort. As a public-private collaboration with more than 40 companies in key roles of recruitment and data analysis, the All of Us project is an exemplar of the increasing corporatization of translational medicine and of how such projects are being conveyed to the public in terms of public service in the name of uh, the nation's health. Okay. Um, so in a recent s article in Science Translational Medicine, Sam Gambier, a colleague of mine at Stanford, who is also the director of Precision Health, uh, of the Precision Health and Integrated Diagnostic Center, um, and his colleagues outlined a roadmap for Precision Health, reinvigorating uh, in the trope of empowerment. Uh, they write, um, that uh, the active practice of personalized health can change the custom of society so that the individual is empowered to prevent their own disease. Uh, this uh, empowerment begins with what Gambier and others have identified as a new object of scrutiny, the subclinical, the terrain that is not yet visible but lurks beneath, requiring careful, tedious work of excavation. Surfacing the potential for disease reconfigures the role of physicians into data scientists. In describing the infrastructure needed to realize precision health, Gambier and colleagues introduce the analogy of aircraft engine health. They write, Precision health draws on the experience of another field in which prevention is paramount, aircraft engine health. Modern jet engines are constantly surveyed by hundreds of sensors to prevent engine failure. They go on. Meanwhile, the average American adult visits a healthcare provider fewer than four times a year. Engine repairs are forecasted by digital twins, ultra-high fidelity individual simulations that feed a physics-based engine model with terabytes of real-world sensor data. Uh, in this configuration, uh, the human body as machine is a portal for new ways of knowing in the Foucauldian sense, relying on continual passive uptake of data and download of information that forms an action plan. The problem, Gambier and colleagues note, is uh, the human aspect of behavior. A jet engine cannot resist its sensors, whereas long-term human engagement and health monitoring may, be, may prove challenging, challenging indeed. Uh, despite the ubiquity of wearables and modern, modern, uh, monitoring devices relying on the human to actively practice self-surveillance, um, this may be a, a losing proposition. Precision health is also based on active practice of personalized health, as some have estimated that at least one-third of U.S. customers who use their wearable activity tracker uh, trackers stop actually after six months. To address this, Cam Gambier and colleagues suggest uh, a workaround. Fortunately, non-invasive high-frequency health monitoring can be achieved passively during routine daily activities, overcoming the obstacle of actively modifying human behavior. Thus, continual monitoring is normalized as managing bodies in the name of health, and a numerical ontology becomes everyday practice and the way in which people relate to their own bodies. Now, it's important, I think, in light of uh, the different uh, types of technologies that have emerged, including those uh, in consumer genomics, to understand uh, these in a larger uh, landscape in terms of the project of population health. And, and I've, I've made the argument elsewhere that precision medicine is quickly being, uh, is, is being shifted into precision health and that we need to be attuned to what that means in terms of our questions about um, agency and freedom and a, a sense of responsibility and obligations. Uh, Moon Curry at the CDC has made this argument about shifting to precision health. 
um, in that he says, could the same technologies that propelled precision medicine usher in a parallel era of precision public health beyond treatment of sick individuals? If precision medicine is about providing the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, precision public health can be simply viewed as providing the right intervention to the right population at the right time. Data collection as part of the learning health system emerges as instrumental to this shift. This learning health care, uh, learning health system as described by the Institute of Medicine in its 2015 report is a system in which science, informatics, uh, incentives, uh, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the delivery process and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. In a cycle of analysis and feedback, the learning health system is intended to improve practice through empirical methods in a cycle of constant iteration involving a range of activities, including, uh, including automation, intelligent automation, comparative effectiveness research, positive deviance surveillance, predictive modeling, and clinical decision report, support. In 2012, the National Academy of Medicine, then the Institute of Medicine, uh, the Academy of Medicine, then the Institute of Medicine, published a roadmap to guide the development of the learning health system. From this chart, you can see um, the cycle. Uh, there are various uh, data collection activities that are not limited uh, to the healthcare system, but rather are uh, integrated into uh, one's entire daily life, starting with um, uh, the different types of risk assessments that may happen throughout the life course, but also using the data analytics that you might uh, pick up through different surveillance, passive uh, surveillance systems um, that might be in and out of the home, for example. Um, this is one of the uh, products that has gotten a lot of excitement, actually, at Stanford, um, the smart toilet. Um, and here, uh, Toto, the, the company, has uh, created a toilet that can monitor uh, things like weight, your weight, blood sugar uh, levels, um, other kinds of vital signs, and then uh, seamlessly take that data and upload it uh, into uh, the cloud so that that can be used as a way of providing you feedback in terms of your uh, daily practices. Okay, the learning, health, uh, the learning health system has been justified by strong moral arguments that the systematic collection of data and samples could prevent mortality from medical mistakes and insufficiencies, inefficiency, sorry, uh, in healthcare spending. Many have criticized the need for consent and human subjects review as an impediment to the seamless integration of patient information in creating more effective and efficient systems through data collection activities. Many, including bioethicists, have pointed to the obsolescence of current conceptions of clinical and research ethics and the weaknesses of the dominant paradigm in federal regulations that rely on sharp distinction between research and practice as aligned by the National Commission of the Protection for the Protection of Human Subjects in the 1970s. Rather, they argue that the learning health system demands reconsideration and reconfiguration of what are deemed acceptable measures of protection and must be weighed against the moral imperative to integrate research and practice. Ruth Faden and her colleagues write, quote, the dominant ethical paradigm from the 1970s to the present time is antithetical to and problematic for the learning health care system at a time when clinical practice is far from optimal and learning to improve care is sorely needed. Several hundred thousand people die needlessly each year from medical mistakes. There is reason to believe that adult patients receive only 50% of recommended therapies and that uh, up to 30% of healthcare spending is wasted. Uh, they argue that the current uh, ethics paradigm that require explicit consent for data and sample collection may hinder improvement. As such, Faden and her colleagues suggest the ethical protection should be realigned around what they refer to as a moral priority on learning. This realignment necessitates a set of new obligations for all actors in the learning healthcare system, not only for health professionals and healthcare institutions, but a presumption of obligation that extends to patients who have, who are, um, who are, uh, equipped with a duty to contribute to the ongoing learning that is integrated with the health care they receive. They go on to underscore this realignment as one that is needed to address unjust inequalities in health care that only ongoing systematic data collection can address. The implications of this um, 
is a reframing of patients as de facto research participants obligated to contribute to knowledge as beneficiaries of the healthcare system. Um, and, and they write, and here, let's see. Traditional codes, declarations, and government reports in research ethics and clinical ethics uh, have never emphasized obligations of patients to contribute knowledge as research subjects. These traditional presumptions need to change just as health, pro health professionals and organizations have an obligation to learn, patients have an obligation to contribute to, participate in, and otherwise facilitate learning. In defending this obligation to learn, they call upon John Rawls, principle of the common good in asserting a norm of common purpose. Um, they write that uh, the common interest of members of a society in the healthcare system is that it is positioned to provide each person in the society with quality health care at a cost compatible with individual and societal economic well-being. We also have a common interest in supporting just institutions, including activities that reduce the unjust inequalities. And this is the part that I think is important for us to pause and think about. Securing these common interests is a shared social purpose that we cannot as individuals achieve. Our goals cannot be reached efficiently without near universal participation in learning activities through which benefit, patients benefit from the past contributions of other patients whose information has helped advance knowledge and improve care. While Faden and colleagues acknowledge that not all data collection activities are the same, for example, randomized control trials of an investigational new devices should only include patients who have consented, their proposal suggests a further erosion of the need for consent when explicit hypotheses are absent and data collection is conducted for its potential to answer questions in the future as nonspecific and continually evolving as this process can be. Rather, in this formulation, patients are expected rather obligated uh, because of a common interest in general improvement of health. Citing uh, philosopher David Hume, they write that the moral uh, underpinning for this duty of beneficence is based on the assumption that, quote, all our obligations to do good to society seem to imply something reciprocal. I receive the benefits of society and therefore ought to promote its interests. The discharge of obligations of reciprocity occurs through an established practice of making an appropriate and proportional return, returning benefit with proportional benefit, with all alike sharing as a matter of moral obligation the burdens necessary to produce these benefits." End quote. However, these, this question of benefit and value is left largely implicit and assumed. This emphasis on benefit sharing as a justification for duty and obligation is problematic given what we know about the distribution of benefit in our healthcare system and the outside burden and risk of data collection for certain populations. As Faden and col uh, colleagues recognize, the compartmentalization of research and clinical care is increasingly difficult to maintain, so too is siloing uh, and regulating of personal data and samples within strict domains of health and non-health. With the blurring of these domains and the travel of data in and out of systems, basic questions of who gets access to the big data sets, for what purpose, in what context, and what constraints are left largely unanswered. Furthermore, regardless of a shared common interest, it is, clear, uh, it is unclear whether there is equitable distribution of the common good to all would-be good citizens, bio-citizens. Algorithms used to make distinctions in the form of risk ratios are, by and large, covered by an opaque veil of secrecy, which is backed by corporate claims of trade secrecy and intellectual property. In the genomics and big data environment, algorithms deliver practically, practically uncontestable uh, results. Okay, so I know I'm near my time, so I'll try to quickly uh, conclude. Uh, in several, uh, in parallel, several scholars have theorized that market capitalism and neoliberal governance have created a set of expectations that individuals should be responsible for their health status and that it is incumbent upon them to apply individual risk information in their daily decision making to improve their health. These everyday practices involve a continual monitoring and mitigating of risks. The focus on individual behavior by information seekers reflects a strategic shift in responsibility from the state onto individuals and groups who feel a moral obligation to engage in a deliberate decision, uh, deliberate decisions of health care, fueled by a desire to be and perceived as responsible, rational, and self-actualizing. Central to neoliberal rationality is the core issue of personal choice. Liberty, freedom, and the semblance of agency are ideals of neoliberalism and have been used to transfer responsibilities of the state over to citizens in effort to empower them to be self-governing, in enterprising individuals. 
Um, is that the time for discussion? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna conclude um, by saying, uh, consumer genomics is emblematic of an emerging paradigm of self-improvement in framing individual consumption and management of personal genetic information as moral acts uh, in the logic of precision medicine. The logic of consumer genetics has led to the growing infrastructure of data collection and ongoing surveillance, and this shift prompts important questions that deserve critical uh, attention and examination. What is the responsibility of patients uh, to acquiesce to inequities uh, acquiesce to the demands of submitting data, bodily materials, and ongoing surveillance? How do we address inequities in value and benefit in relationship to risk and potential for harm? This begins with a serious discussion of disparities, bias, and structures of inequality that put into question what is shared in the common good. If health technology does not address the questions of data for whom, when, and why, then it will be a failure of social justice and abuse of the trust that people have placed in the institutions of healthcare. So I'll end there. I'm sorry for going over. <laughs> yes. Um, I have so many questions. If I may ask two, and then uh, and you can decide how long and if you want to answer either. Sure. Yeah. So the first one is about um, how direct consumer genetics are regulated. They fall under the FDA's in vitro diagnostics devices, um, and I'm wondering. What does it mean, and how does it? Tr how do genetic tests trouble notions of risk and diagnosis when we have a diagnostic test being used for risk assessment? So, diagnostics as a yes or no versus risk assessment, kind of um, enveloping all these different factors and kind of being as a percentage rather than a yes no. And then the second question has to do with this moral duty of the good bio citizen. Um, what does it mean for this moral duty of the individual? Um, when they are contributing this donation or this participation to the market rather than to the state. So does that, if, and these I guess are both, does it make a difference? If it does make a difference between the state and the market, what does that mean for these individual contributions? And does it change at all? Yeah, so lots of really good questions. Uh, uh, I think that in terms of the FDA, and I think there are probably uh, better experts in the room that might uh, answer that question in terms of uh, what the FDA has done over time. When I started this research uh, with, tw with 23andMe uh, customers, it was before the FDA actually cracked down and, and took away um, their health-related tests. Um, and, uh, you know, 23andMe has, um, has done a lot of work, I think, in the last few years, and we see now that there's now a, an open portal for them to bring back many of the health-related tests that, that were um, uh, previously disallowed. Um, and so I think what we're going to see is an expansion. Um, the FDA has uh, decided to, um, to allow some of the, the, the tests to go through. Um, so, you know, I think we'll have to wait and see, and I'd, I'd encourage anybody else who has more information about what, what the FDA is doing in this space um, to speak up. Um, in terms of your other question about what does it matter if it's a contribution to the state versus the market, and I think, um, actually, part of the point of the, the talk is to say, well, you know, we think about these domains as somehow having a very strong boundary, and they're actually, uh, we see increasingly that those boundaries are not so strong. Uh, we can see this in terms of the All of Us initiative, for example, where commercial entities and the state are actually very blurred in terms of who's doing what work for, for what purpose. Um, and so this is an evolving kind of landscape, and I, I think it does a disservice for us to think about um, the different silos in which uh, data is held. So, for example, in, in one of the studies that we're doing um, in the Bay Area with a community health system that is trying to uh, build its own biobank, um, there is this sense that, well, you know, this is my local health system, it's my physician that's asking me for uh, the biological sample, it's going to be all fine because it's going to somehow stay within this realm. And um, what we know is that actually data travels 
uh, samples travel. Um, I don't know how many more uh, stories we need to, to realize that the circuits of data flow are not going to um, stop, uh, you know, they're not, they're not contained in particular uh, domains anymore. And so if we can think creatively about one, how to relate this to the public and allowing them to have, uh, allowing all of us to have a discussion, an open discussion about that kind of data flow, I think it's critical um, for us to start thinking about what's really happening here in terms of my contribution. Is it a contribution? Uh, do I, should I get something back for that contribution, et cetera? Thank you. This was so interesting. I also feel like I have a zillion questions for you. But the, I, my first comment is I'm just struck by um, the title of this whole conference and thinking about what you just said in terms of the weight. It's just so much information. And so I really appreciated how your talk went along so well with this. And then also thinking about how you can get your weight by just by going to the bathroom. I mean, oh my God, what a recipe for eating disorders, I feel that would be just so horrible if you had to see how much you weighed every time you went to the bathroom, it'd be terrible. Um, but my question is, um, do, do, do companies like 23andMe um, take any responsibility other than maybe a little disclaimer, which I imagine they must have, but maybe they don't even have that in terms of I'm thinking of the quote by Peter there saying that, well, now I don't need to, basically I felt he was implying, now I don't need my colonoscopy because I'm just going to, you know, I just have average risk for colon cancer, so I don't need to, you know, get this other test. And I'm just wondering if they have any, what they say about this when they... Uh, give back this information. Yeah, well, I don't think it's a, it's not a little disclaimer. It's actually a rather large disclaimer saying that this is not uh, medical information um, and that if you, whatever information you get, you should take to your clinician um, and have a discussion with them. So in a sense, they're outsourcing a lot to the healthcare system. Um, and I think you're absolutely right in that um, the way in which it actually uh, is consumed on the ground is not... Uh, it's, it's, it flies in the face. I mean, they know that their market is because they give some information about managing your health. And so um, for Peter, um, he did have a sense of relief. Um, and given his, his family history, uh, you worry that this, this kind of sense of relief might prevent him from doing the kinds of things we would like him to do. Um, we just don't know. I mean, we could follow up on the Peters in the world to see if that's true. I think that's part of our... Uh, in terms of empirical bioethics work, that's something that we can do to see if, if really um, this is causing harm. Uh, but it, it's problematic because in the sense, um, in terms of the regulatory uh, landscape, they're, uh, you know, they have to, they, they are uh, kind of framing their product as recreational still, even though clearly it is being consumed as uh, information that is going to be used in healthcare decision making, right? This is our last question. Uh, thank you for that talk. So this is going to your um, point about, you know, for whom does this system work, whom does it benefit? And um, I'm thinking specifically about how people with intellectual disabilities might fare under a regime of precision medicine. Because it seems like there, there are two problems. One is that um, the neoliberal ideal that you were talking about that, that governs this program um, is ability-based. It, it, it depends on the ability to reflect on the future, to process information, to consider abstractions like risk. And the other conundrum is that um, um, intellectual disabilities are categorically uncertain, that for some people they're unambiguously a bad thing and fall under health, and for many people who have them and those who are linked to them, it is, it's a uh, part of human diversity. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as we kind of barrel into this future, what is the place of this most marginalized, one of the most marginalized groups going to be? Yeah, no, I think you're asking the hard questions, right? So, uh, so it's, it's unclear, but I, I will say that um, this, you know, increasing search for certainty in something that's inherently uncertain is, is, is really, quite problematic, and, I, and I'll just bring up an example that I mentioned in, in discussion um, with some others, that 
um, this idea that somehow um, genetic information is is the disease, you, the information is conflated in a, in a way that risk becomes equated with disease, essentially. Um, and so uh, this idea that you have a system that's uh, ever seeking efficiency and cost savings and less burden for society in general, you wonder where this is going to go. And, and I've, I've gotten a little taste of it through um, some research that a colleague of mine um, is doing, uh, Danton Char at Stanford, where, um, you know, inf genetic testing results um, that might be, uh, that, that children, uh, might be tested for particular adult onset diseases, for example, you know, how that information um, might be used in, in decisions around organ transplantation, for example, a, a good that we have very scarce resources, uh, it's a scarce resource, how do we then um, use genetic information, risk information, um, as a way of leveraging uh, potential, you know, use of, of different resources. And so, I mean, I, I see a little bit of what you're talking about in that example, and we're seeing it play it out where uh, clinicians are actually very eager for this information because they have to make those tough decisions. And, and the ways in which, for example, um, genetic risk for schizophrenia might be used uh, on a child who has no no symptoms, no, I mean, much less the basic question of why are we making those kinds of adjudications um, in terms of, of value and, and potential benefit and harm and all of those kinds of things. So I think this is, this is a very rich area for a lot of good thinking and particularly, I think, in the humanities. So. Thank you.